Welcome everybody to the Cambridge Forum discussing uh, challenges of globalization. It is a real uh, pleasure and an honor to share this podium with uh, Danny Roderick, uh, who, uh, whose work uh, I've followed uh, with great interest uh, for a long time. Um, I want to quote a couple of things from his book, The Globalization Paradox, that, that I found of particular interest. Uh, he says, um, f markets and governments are complements, not opposites. And uh, he goes on to say, if you want more and better markets, you have to have more and better governance. Markets work best not where states are weakest, but where they are strong. Now, that's not a typical uh, economist viewpoint, and um, it, it is a wonderful to see uh, an eminent economist uh, engage with the realities of politics and of statecraft and of the relationship between governance to the well-recognized imperfections of markets of which we just saw a profound example in the collapse of 2008. And if you think about it, the democratic small d project of the past 100, 125 years has really been about housebreaking capitalism for the benefit of ordinary people so that we can somehow marry the dynamism of markets to the predictability and the accountability of, of civil democratic uh, societies. The problem is that when we globalize, which according to the theory of comparative advantage is a good thing because it optimizes the efficiency of markets, we make the market uh, harder to govern in the public interest. And we run risks of markets periodically going haywire, as they did in the Great Depression and uh, in the crash of 2008. But at a less cataclysmic uh, level, we have difficulty domesticating markets so that we can achieve all the things that markets don't do so well. We, we have a nation state. We are citizens of a nation state. We are not citizens of the Republic of NAFTA. Much less are we citizens of the World Trade Organization. And that's really the subject of, of Danny's uh, fine book and uh, his talk tonight. I want to quote the other essential paragraph of his book, which he will embellish, I'm sure, in greater detail. He says, you have to understand what I call the fundamental political trilemma of the world economy. We cannot simultaneously pursue democracy, national determination, and economic globalization. If we want to push globalization further, we will have to give up either the nation state or democratic politics. If we want to maintain and deepen democracy, we have to choose between the nation state and international economic integration. And if we want to keep the nation state, and self-determination, we have to choose between deepening democracy and deepening globalization. And uh, Professor Roderick, who teaches at Harvard, uh, differentiates between deep globalization and shallow globalization, uh, a distinction uh, made by his colleague, uh, Bob Lawrence, who was an absolutely mainstream economist. And uh, Danny basically comes out on the side of shallow globalization because he appreciates the importance of having a democratic nation state that is competent both to domesticate uh, the market and to articulate and represent uh, the interests of, of people in a democracy. If we go too far in the direction of globalization for its own sake, we end up undermining both efficiency and uh, democracy. So with that, let me not steal any more of uh, Danny Roderick's eloquent thunder and turn the podium over to him. Thank you very much, uh, Bob. Bob Kottner has, uh, has been uh, uh, very kind, too kind to my work over the years, so I want to take this uh, opportunity um, uh, to, to thank him um, and also for this uh, very kind and, and gracious uh, introduction. Uh, before we started, uh, we were talking about uh, what a beautiful evening it is out there and, and uh, you know, who would be actually coming in on, on, such, a, uh, on such a night uh, to, to listen to such a somber uh, topic. Uh, 
Um, and, uh, and it is uh, true that, that I'm an economist, and as an economist, I'm, I'm duty-bound to deliver a dismal message to you. Uh, but I do, want to, um, I do want to start with something that's a bit uh, more cheery, uh, start with the uh, upside of globalization. Um, and probably the most important thing that has happened uh, in the world economy over the last 30 years uh, is uh, China. Uh, not just China's emergence as a major uh, economic power, uh, but much more importantly, we care about uh, human uh, people uh, and, and uh, humanity and, and people and, and, uh, and poverty. Uh, China has managed uh, to engineer the world's greatest poverty reduction program ever. Um, since the late 1970s or early 1980s, which is when uh, China's economic reform started, um, the number of people in China uh, which uh, are below the, uh, the $1, a day, $1 a day poverty line um, has fallen by 650 million people, 650 million fewer people in extreme poverty in China over the, uh, this uh, period of, of, of three decades. Um, the actual incidence of extreme poverty, that is the number, the proportion of people um, that live below the poverty line, has gone down in the same period from 84% to 13%, 84% down to 13%. And this is over a period um, where China's overall population has grown by something like 35 percent, um, yet the, uh, the incidence of poverty has gone down to, uh, to such an extent. Um, it's, to me, inconceivable, and this is why I'm calling this the, the upside or the cheery side of globalization, it, it's inconceivable that China could have achieved such a poverty reduction miracle, such a growth miracle, uh, without a turn towards markets, without embracing globalization. So if you want to look at what globalization is actually capable of delivering, uh, look at China and keep that in mind in terms of uh, what globalization is able to do uh, for some countries that start out very poor, uh, but by virtue of, of uh, being able to turn towards markets and global markets in particular, can achieve this significant transformation of their economies. So globalization can be a tremendous force for, for good, uh, but China, interestingly, of course, illustrates for us one of the many paradoxes that I talk about in this book, uh, because the manner in which China embraced globalization wasn't by the book. That is to say, uh, it did virtually, you know, sort of maybe half of the things that um, Americans and American-controlled institutions and my colleagues here uh, at Harvard, uh, other economists, would have asked uh, developing countries to do. Um, and pretty much the other half um, have been uh, completely unorthodox, um, uh, um, heterodox uh, policies. Uh, so China's experience with globalization has been one of managed globalization. Um, uh, I like uh, the expression that I once heard from a Chinese student uh, at the Kennedy School um, who, when talking about China's approach to globalization, he said, uh, it's like you open the window, but then you put on a screen to keep the mosquitoes out. Um, the open window makes sure that you get the fresh air, but with the screen, you're keeping the bugs out. Um, and uh, that's what China has done. So it has taken globalization, um, and uh, it has leveraged it, uh, but it has uh, set its own rules, uh, it has created new rules, uh, it has um, uh, used its own trade and industrial policies, its macroeconomic policies to restructure its economy. Um, and the broader, broader message uh, that we learn from China's, China's experience uh, is that if you want to turn towards capitalism, if you want capitalism to work for you, uh, which even though China is a socialist country, that's effectively how they've gotten that poverty reduction, uh, you have to get the balance right between the markets and the state. Uh, it's been the complementarity between the markets and what the state has done, which has worked so well uh, for China. Um, capitalism uh, is not just one thing. Capitalism 
is a system, uh, it's a set of institutions that is malleable, that changes, that we shape. Uh, in fact, the history of capitalism is one of uh, adaptation. Um, I think um, Bob just put it very nicely. He said the last 100, 150 years has been one of housebreaking of markets or of capitalism. Um, the earliest version of capitalism, uh, the one that uh, uh, one learns from textbook economics, uh, the simplest version of capitalism going back to Adam Smith was the one where markets were relatively uh, free self-standing, that they would work on their own, um, and you needed very little state support for, govern for markets to work. Um, when you go back to Adam Smith, um, uh, Adam Smith does talk about some of the things that the government that uh, needs to do in order to support markets, but those are relatively minimal things. The government needs to provide for national defense, it needs to provide for the protection of property rights, and it needs to provide a reasonably decent administration of justice. So once you provide those things, then you let markets run free and you get all the wonderful things that markets can deliver. Um, that early vision of um, uh, ca capitalism with a minimal uh, state was basically how uh, um, economies were run in the 19th century under the gold standard rules. Um, it's also the vision that still inspires today's libertarian uh, view of economic policy, to take that basically government should have just a minimal role uh, in, in markets. Uh, that's a vision of markets and economics that uh, completely separate markets and disembed it uh, from politics. But um, the great success of capitalist societies um, in the last century or century and a half is actually built not on that minimalist vision, uh, it's built on a vision uh, that is much, that provides a much bigger role uh, for states and for public institutions. Because over the course of the 20th century, uh, we've learned that markets are in fact not, for the most part, self-creating. They actually need public institutions uh, to get started and to, uh, to, to, um, uh, to, uh, to get going. They're not self-regulating, so you need public agencies, other institutions to regulate them. They're not self-stabilizing, that is, they are prone to business cycles, unemployment, and crises, so you need uh, macroeconomic, fiscal, and monetary institutions to stabilize markets. And ultimately, markets are not self-legitimizing, because there's nothing that guarantees that what markets produce are going to be consistent with social values and norms that society desires. So you need institutions of uh, um, uh, social insurance, uh, institutions of, of uh, safety nets, um, um, and, and, uh, and other welfare state arrangements uh, to bring markets and what they do in line with broader social goals. Um, so the big, big takeaway from the way that markets evolved from that narrower conception of Adam Smith over the course of the 20th century, the big takeaway is that markets need to be embedded in a wide range of non-market institutions, these regulatory, stabilizing, and legitimizing institutions. Um, during the second half of the 20th century, that is after the Second World War, that conception was realized uh, by combining, on the one hand, Keynesian macroeconomic management, uh, the institutions of the welfare state, and uh, in a lot of countries, including the newly uh, um, in independent emerging countries, developing countries, institutions of industrial policy, institutions of economic restructuring uh, to diversify away from their, um, their natural resource or primary product base. Now, this system, uh, which we sometimes call the Bretton Woods regime, uh, the, um, this more elaborate embedded version of uh, markets or market capitalism uh, that existed for a few decades, uh, that reached its zenith in a few decades after Second World War, uh, worked well but f had one fatal flaw. Um, and that fatal flaw uh, was that it was a system of national, 
capitalisms. That is that all the institutions of regulation, stabilization, legitimization, in which markets were embedded, which helped markets do their job, which sustained markets, uh, were nation, we were national. They were not transnational or international. Um, uh, and the original uh, designers of the system, and of course uh, John Maynard Keynes himself, was the key architect of the system uh, in the immediate aftermath of the post-war uh, period, understood uh, a key implication of this, which was that as long as these institutions that support markets, that help markets work, are primarily national, they're based uh, in, within nation states, there are inherent limits to how far we can integrate markets across national borders, how much we can push markets beyond national borders. That's why, for example, Keynes argued very uh, um, uh, um, heavily uh, in 1944 and 45 uh, that this new system, this new global economic system would have to be one where capital controls, regulations on the free flow of finance, restrictions on the free flow of finance, would have to be an integral part of the system. And he viewed these restrictions on the free flow of, of finance not as a temporary expedient, one that um, was necessary only, at, un, only until the world economy uh, regained its footing, but importantly as a permanent feature of this new arrangement because he understood that without some restrictions on the free flow of capital, it would have been impossible for countries to pursue independently the kind of macroeconomic policies uh, that they needed in order to stabilize uh, their economies. And of course, you can say pretty much the same about their, uh, their welfare state, their tax regime, their industrial policies uh, as well. Um, the Bretton Woods regime, the Keynesian regime of, of embedded uh, uh, capitalism was so successful that uh, we made the mistake of thinking that we could do one better. Um, and what that one better was is the system that we uh, found ourselves moving towards uh, after the um, 1990s. Um, starting sometime in the er late 1980s and early 1990s, we have been increasingly moving into an era of what I call the push for hyper-globalization. I call this hyper-globalization to distinguish it from the earlier era of globalization that prevailed in the immediate decades after the Second World War. Now, um, if that earlier era was based on the understanding that in order for markets to be healthy, uh, they needed to be embedded within national systems of governance, uh, the basic push uh, for hyper-globalization uh, was that we should eliminate all sources of friction uh, that restricted the free flow of goods and uh, free flow of capital, even if those restrictions emanated or derived from domestic policies and regulation. So we reversed our priorities uh, to one where, in fact, um, pursuing uh, globalization became an end in and of itself. Um, the practical, uh, the practical uh, manner in which uh, this new push uh, exhibited itself was first in the form of the World Trade Organization, uh, which created um, a, uh, a, a vastly expanded set of rules over world trade um, and investment, and on the other uh, side, financial globalization, where um, the norm for international capital flows became that they ought to be free rather than restricted and regulated as under the Keynesian uh, system. Um, the problem with this push for hyper-globalization uh, was that it led us to an era where these domestic institutions, domestic governance, was progressively weakened by the forces of increasing uh, uh, economic globalization, while at the same time, the global mechanisms of governance uh, remained at best uh, incomplete. So uh, we ended up with a, uh, a deficit of, of governance of markets uh, um, all, all over. Um, there was one part of the world which tried to buck the trend, 
um, and that was Europe. Because Europe, for a while, tried to create the kind of transnational institutions, uh, economic, legal, regulatory, political, uh, that would match the creation of a, a truly European single market. And for a while, it looked like uh, that might have been uh, at least a viable form of a regional hyperglobalization. Unfortunately, uh, today we see that even that project was doomed to fail uh, because the kind of institutional, um, uh, the, the kind of the, the building up of, of transnational institutions that Europe uh, engaged in remained very, very partial, remained very incomplete, uh, limited to monetary institutions and a common monetary regime. Uh, and a common financial system, but with very little integration on the side of regulations, on the side of fiscal policy, and indeed with very little creation of a common political space, uh, which could make European finance uh, accountable uh, to a, a, a Europe-wide political community. So the result of this uh, flaw, the result of this uh, weakening of governance, uh, both domest domestically and the incompleteness of governance globally, while markets were straining to become global, was on the one hand economic malfunction, uh, which we've seen in the, uh, in, 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 in the types of financial crises and uneven development around the world that we have experienced. On the other hand, politically, the costs were a sense on the part of, of most uh, ordinary voters that they were uh, losing um, voice, uh, that there were problems, deep problems of democratic legitimacy in the sense that dom domestic governments uh, were, uh, were, were, their responsiveness were limited, um, and increasing concerns over inequality and the lack of level playing fields uh, in, in, um, in, in global competition. Now, uh, when I talk about trade and globalization um, with my students, um, I try to get them to see both the advantages, the economic advantages that trade and globalization can create, but also the sense in which international trade is different from domestic competition and how, in fact, it creates some of these issues of legitimacy. So I run them through a series of uh, thought experiments. I tell them, uh, suppose um, Harry and John are two individuals that own two firms uh, in the United States, and Harry and John and their firms compete with each other. And then I ask them, how do you feel about these following cases? And the first case is that Harry works really, really hard, saves and invests a lot, and ends up outcompeting John, driving John out of business, and therefore, not only John, but also John's employees lose their jobs. And I asked them, how do you feel about this? Do you feel okay about this outcome? Well, most of them say, well, you know, this is how competition happens. If somebody works hard, uh, you know, of course, they should get the rewards of working hard, even if it turns out that some other people are hurt as a result. And if, Harry, if, if John lost out, it was because somebody worked harder. Um, then I say, okay, um, suppose that um, uh, what has really happened is that Harry finds a cheaper supplier in Britain and is able to import from Britain cheaper inputs and with that becomes more competitive and is able to drive uh, John out of business. Um, on this they think a little bit more, but again most of them say, well, you know, uh, this is competition, why shouldn't it happen if, 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 if uh, Harry is the one who had the bright idea of, of sourcing from, uh, from Britain and therefore getting those benefits, that that is okay too. But they're beginning to have some doubts as to whether in fact the kind of competition that crosses national borders is the same or different from competition domestically. Then third, I, I ask them the following uh, um, thought experiment. I say, suppose that Harry decides to outsource to an Indonesian affiliate, and the Indonesian affiliate uh, employs child workers in 12-hour day, sh day shifts and under extremely hazard hazardous conditions. Now, at this point, uh, most of them are, say, are, are going to say that uh, this is not okay. This is not an okay form of competition, although it is a form of trade, and by the way, today's rules in the context of the World Trade Organization enforces that countries have to treat this kind of trade just the same way that they would treat 
the first, the, the, my second example, where you were importing goods from Britain. Uh, that if you were actually to impose, if the U.S. were to impose any kinds of restrictions on imports from Indonesia, that, that they, the U.S. would be violating um, uh, um, uh, trade rules. My last, uh, my last uh, thought experiment uh, is meant to, to drive home the point in as extreme form as possible. I asked them what they would think if what Harry does is, rather than engaging in trade, Harry simply brings in some Indonesian child workers into the United States under temporary contracts and puts them to work in the United States under conditions that violate U.S. labor and environmental laws. Now, of course, this everybody pretty much objects. And by the way, even if they didn't object, it would be illegal for Harry to do this. So it would actually violate uh, U.S. laws to do something like this. But what is the difference between outsourcing to an Indonesian affiliate versus bringing those uh, children into the United States to perform the same uh, function? Uh, so my point is, is that trade is both similar and dissimilar to domestic competition. It is similar insofar as it can create net losers as well as ga gainers in the process of generating wider economic opportunities but it is dissimilar insofar as it forces competition under ground rules that we have prohibited at home. And I think when rules differ widely across trading countries, uh, we then need to confront difficult questions about distributive justice and about procedural fairness that our current discourse, our current narrative about economic globalization and how in fact it doesn't matter a whit whether it's my second kind of example of importing goods from Britain or importing goods from uh, child workers in Indonesia, that that doesn't make any difference. In both cases, it's comparative advantage and gains from trade, uh, that, that uh, actually our, our basic normative intuition um, is conflicting uh, with the rules that we have imposed on the world trading regime. And I think if globalization lacks legitimacy at home, I would argue that it is in large part because we have avoided uh, such debates. Uh, but the tricky thing, of course, is to engage in, in such debates without necessarily um, uh, uh, throwing the baby with the bathwater and without uh, necessarily um, uh, denying that, uh, that for the vast majority of trade opportunities, uh, they are, in a fundamental sense, actually no different than, uh, than, than uh, domestic competition. Let me just end by uh, returning uh, to, to China. Uh, as I said, China succeeded uh, because it never bought into the kind of hyper-globalization model. Um, in fact, China uh, played the globalization game not by the post-1990 rules, uh, but it played it by the earlier uh, embedded capitalism kind of rules, the Bretton Woods kinds of rules, because it always created space for itself uh, within which it could restructure its economies, within which it could employ its trade and industrial policies to restructure and subsidize its new industries. And to this day, uh, China is, of course, intervening in currency markets, intervening in financial markets uh, to effectively subsidize its manufacturing industries because this is basically its, its growth model. So China has marched to its own drummer, to its own rules, um, and uh, in, in an extreme way um, has, has brought to light the, the deeply paradoxical nature of, of globalization. As long as China was a relatively small country, of course it never was with the kind of population that it has, but it was as long as it wasn't the economic powerhouse that it has become, um, it could essentially free ride on the willingness of other countries, uh, critically the United States, um, to, uh, to be willing to consume the surplus of goods that China kept producing. But obviously we have run uh, we have reached the end of that particular road. Uh, China has become too important a country uh, to be playing by its own rules while expecting uh, other countries to play by, the post one, by, by simply keeping their markets open. Um, we worry a lot these days about whether sort of the rise of China will entail a, a, a significant re re reorientation of economic power and political power and strategic power in the world. 
uh, I think that China actually faces uh, two very significant problems going forward. Um, and because we don't know what the answers to how those problems are going to be resolved, I think we have great uncertainty about the future uh, of, of, of our economy. Uh, one is the economic problem. As I've said, that China's growth model that has increasingly relied on a huge surplus of goods, a huge trade surplus, uh, is no longer a sustainable growth model. Uh, China will have to change that model. The problem is that it, if changing that will necessarily come at uh, significant domestic social and political cost, and we don't know whether China will be able to handle that. Uh, the deeper problem is a political one, uh, which is that, of course, China remains an authoritarian regime. Um, and um, I am convinced that China's future growth uh, will remain uh, limited uh, by that authoritarian nature of, of, of its regime. And therefore, uh, unlike India, for example, when we look at India, we see a very, very complicated, messy democracy that seems to be working only sort of incrementally at the margin, never, get, never managed to get much of anything right. Uh, but at least India has this political uh, transformation behind it in the sense that it has a democratic regime, whereas uh, China's uh, most important political transformation the political opening, uh, the, the, the democratization of its national system uh, is still ahead of it, and that's going to be one huge challenge uh, that the Chinese economy faces. So I'm much more pessimistic than many who are simply projecting in a linear fashion uh, that China's growth and China's economic power will, will continue to uh, pace and that China will become a major power. The problem, of course, is China is already a power, and so therefore, uh, the consequences of, uh, of, of these challenges and how China handles these challenges will be felt not only in China, but it will be felt uh, in the world uh, as a whole, including, of course, the United States. So let me just uh, stop here. The main here. actor is uh, commercial and financial elites who are perfectly happy to see all the constraints on the market be undermined by globalization. Uh, thereby not having to worry about taxes, regulation, trade unions, and all the other things that were built up by democratic polities uh, over the past 125 years. So if, if that's the case, if the most important players are uh, our friends who crashed the system, and they have a huge amount of political power, um, what, <laughs> by what theory of agency do we turn that around so that your very attractive principles that did govern at the level of the nation state during the Keynesian era can be resurrected at the level of the global economy here. So you take the podium and I'll, I'll go see the next one. Thank you. Uh, great, great question. A very, very difficult one, too. Uh, uh, I, I think, let me, let me try to triangulate that question in a number of different ways. One thing to just to start off with, um, I, I think the amount of independence and relative power that the commercial and financial elites have vis-a-vis -vis their home governments uh, is vastly exaggerated. And I think we saw that very clearly in the aftermath of the financial crisis. So when GM and Ford and, and Wall Street ran into trouble, uh, you know, they didn't go into uh, the IMF or the World Trade Organization. They needed the home government. They needed the Fed and the Treasury um, and, the, and the federal government to bail them out. Uh, so it was, it was, you know, in the end, um, so the, the, you know, they have their the domestic governments that need to support them. Um, now, uh, the question is, if in regular times, so you're saying, well, in crisis times, maybe, you know, the governments have some leverage over them, and maybe they could, they could have you know, used that leverage, exercised that leverage more effectively than they have. But in normal times, clearly, relative power of these uh, um, you know, sort of uh, financial firms and, and multinationals is, is uh, such that national governments cannot do much. Um, what I would say is that, that um, we may be underestimating the uh, the influence and power of ideas over raw interests. 
because we think that these financial interests, the banks and the multinationals, have, have very fixed conceptions of what actually their interests are. And I would argue that their uh, ideas about what their, it, where their interests are, are in part driven by sort of the, the general ideology and the ideas in the air, what sort of the, the, the you know, whether you call them market fundamentalist ideas and, 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 and so forth. So if in the run-up to the financial crisis, uh, the national government, Washington, became beholden to financial interests, uh, it wasn't just because financial interests were able to make huge campaign contributions and lobby and, and ex exert sheer power, it was also because there was a conception of what good economic policy was, and that idea about good economic policy convinced Washington and the Feds that whatever was good for Wall Street was good for um, the United States. That was an idea. And without that idea that legitimated or legitimized the power of financial interests, I don't think we would have gotten policy so much more, so much aligned uh, with the interests of financial groups um, uh, as we ended up getting. So I'm, I'm, I'm arguing, and maybe this is a totally self-serving argument, right? We're, I'm an academic. I'd like to think that it's all ideas that matter and not power. But what I'm saying is that basically, you know, powerful interests need ideas to figure out what their, what, where their interests lie. And uh, these multinationals can define their interests as being, well, you know, we need, you know, school, we need a skilled um, labor force uh, that we can employ without much turnover, with great degree of loyalty, so that we actually have a productive, devoted, loyal workforce. That, by the way, means that we need to invest locally in our skill, in our workforce. That means we need to support our education policies at home. Um, we need a sort of a high quality set of input producer, input providers uh, to benefit from agglomeration economies and that means we need uh, communities that are actually able to uh, uh, produce those kinds of, of, of productive input uh, suppliers. That means we need to invest in the infrastructure of our local communities and that, that's how we compete with China. But that's how we compete with the rising powers, is by becoming sort of, you know, more productive in that way, uh, as opposed to necessarily outsourcing to other places where labor environmental standards might be low, where cheap, you know, where cost is cheap. Um, now, which of those strategies is, do, do, do the interests of these multinationals uh, coincide with? Uh, it's all about ideas and about conceptions of where your interests are, who you are, and, and how you best serve your long-term interests. Uh, so I'm not suggesting that that will always work in the direction of, uh, you know, tying uh, these, uh, these interests closer to the national government, to the national setting, uh, but I'm suggesting that at least part of this disconnect uh, is because of the ideology um, of, of, of market fundamentalism and liberalism that, that basically has convinced uh, these powerful interests that they don't need anything from their domestic setting. Uh, so that, that can change. Uh, I don't want to completely uh, sort of, you know, the obvious thing, of course, is that, that you know, there, that some rebalancing of political power, that is, is it's, has to happen without, you know, one, you know, it's quite clearly uh, that, you know, that we can envisage uh, forms of, of, uh, of reform of campaign finance and lobbying and so forth that would definitely go in the right direction. But I just wanted to purposefully argue uh, the part that it's, it's really, a lot of it is really about ideas and the change in ideas from the Keynesian kind of, of, of setting of the uh, 50s and 60s to today that is at least partially responsible uh, for the outcomes that we've gotten and uh, not necessarily 100% uh, the power of, of, of these interests. One, one quick response. Uh, you, you weren't here for the afternoon session, but I think your description of financial and commercial elites concluding that um, they need infrastructure, they need reliable, well-trained well workers, they need local agglomerations of inputs, um, I think is a perfect description of how German capitalists view comparative advantage, but not at all a description of how American capitalists view, uh, notwithstanding the collapse. American uh, enterprise is more than ever committed to outsourcing low, low taxes, uh, cheap labor, and to the extent that elites are investing in education, they're investing in fads in, involving uh, 
uh, vouchers, goals that are unproven, and uh, it's become almost a hobby of, of hedge funds to kind of throw money at educational fads. So what's really interesting, in, in, in light of your view that nations should be free to pursue their own strategies, not constrained by a kind of a one-size-fits-all version of globalization, I think the difference between, say, how Germany pursues its version of what's in the social and economic national interest and how the U.S. Chamber of Commerce does, I think, proves your point. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yes, please. Well, thank you very much, Professor Roderick. <clears throat> I'm particularly attracted to your notion that ideas might count. I'm not encouraged, however, <clears throat> by the exchange here in the sense that one of the ideas that seems not to count is the notion of us living on a finite planet. In other words, the notion of growth seems to be built in both to your description of what has happened and to what China is doing now and the like. So the suggestion that we might get to the idea of beyond growth, slow growth, no growth on a finite planet doesn't seem to be within the purview of what you're suggesting, even though an ecologist will tell you that it's the necessary next idea. Self-imposed, self-restraint for the human population on a finite planet. Well, I think the issue of resource scarcity and, and, and the, the, the population problem, I, I think these are very, very serious problems. I, I think, though, that um, for certainly the poorer parts of the world, um, I think uh, the answers, for example, to the population explosion, uh, the fact that in many poor parts of uh, the planet, Africa being a, a, a clear example, uh, that, that population growth is, 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 is too rapid and it's putting huge amount of pressure on, on scarce uh, natural resources, arable land and so forth. Uh, I think the answer to that somewhat paradoxically actually is going to be more development, not less. The reason for that uh, is that uh, what's doing the worst damage to the planet in those countries uh, is, um, is the fact that those countries tend to uh, be monocrop economies where uh, most of the population is engaged in, in very land intensive uh, agricultural work. Um, and what development and growth actually does bring is diversification, is getting, getting people away from those uh, extremely um, resource uh, consuming patterns of growth. Uh, the example I like to give uh, is uh, the example of Mauritius, uh, which is a, a tiny island uh, in the Indian uh, Ocean, uh, which um, in the 60s was facing major uh, population, climate, resource catastrophe of the kind that, uh, that, 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 that you mentioned. Um, and at the time, in the early 60s, it was still a British colony. And the, and the, and the British, uh, that were, were getting ready to give Mauritius its in, independence, uh, were so uh, concerned about what was going to happen to Mauritius, um, given that basically 80% of the population grew sugar, uh, population was growing at 3% per year, uh, the island was running out of arable land, and it was a true Malthusian uh, sort of disaster awaiting uh, that island. Um, it, you know, a team of very, very famous economists went to study and, and the island and they came back totally alarmed and panicked about what was going to happen. The true story of what happened in Mauritius is that today, by the way, Mauritius is a country that has reached, uh, that has grown very rapidly, that has reached income levels of countries in southern Europe, um, is a democratic country uh, with social stability and social peace. And the reason they managed to evade the Malthusian time bomb is precisely because they got all those people who were growing sugar uh, into factories, into producing textiles and garments for world markets. And then, you know, light manufacturers, simple manufacturers, and so forth. Um, and you know, once families had better employment opportunities for their children, uh, fertility rates began to come down, so growth, that was population growth that was increasing at 3% began to fall, uh, population growth uh, uh, stabilized, um, and, and, and that the problem was averted, mm -hmm. they became uh, a much wealthier, uh, much, much happier uh, nation. Now, that's the rosy part of the picture, but I'm saying that many countries uh, in, in, in Africa are not too different uh, 
uh, today from uh, where Mauritius uh, was in the 1960s. So I think for them to say that, that you are not going to grow, you're not going to be developing, is basically to say that you continue to produce the kinds of things that you're going to be producing. And they'll keep them both in poverty and in that kind of Malthusian situation rather than uh, save them from them. It's not true for all other parts of the country, I th for, for the world. I think China faces a, a, a severe environmental problem, and I think growing, a slowing down of the growth in China and a, a significant change in its uh, energy-intensive path of growth is definitely required there. And of course, globally, we have a huge climate change problem uh, that, that we need to address. Uh, but I think we need to do that without necessarily concluding uh, that the poorest parts of the world um, also should be deprived of their growth opportunities because I don't think we'd be doing them any favors. Uh, please. Professor Broderick, um, I'm, a <coughs> I'm Andrew Litvitsky. I'm a journalist and a documentary producer and I'm long uh, been an admirer of your work as well as that of Bob Kuttner. And I applaud your current analysis of the mixed results from, from globalization. Uh, I don't know if you would call yourself a neoliberal economist, but implicit in your analysis is a, is a criticism of neoliberal economic precepts. Many of your colleagues, um, including Stiglitz and Spence and Rubini, uh, they um, uh, placed the turning point of the process you describe as the transition from the Bretton Woods model to the neoliberal supply side model developed by Reagan in the US and Kat Thatcher in England, which after three decades have brought us to where we are today. So what role would you attribute to neoliberal economics in the uh, result that we have today? And how would you evaluate the results of Germany and the Nordic countries, not to mention the Asian countries, which never bought into ne neoliberal economics? and today are prospering and uh, weathering the so-called great contraction in a very good condition. Thank you. Uh, yes, I, I, I am a critic of, of neoliberal uh, ideas, and I think sort of these neoliberal ideas, you know, sometimes we call market fundamentalism, um, uh, um, sometimes with, with other names. Uh, but I've always um, argued that, that neoliberal ideas or neoliberalism is really a perversion of uh, contemporary economics. Uh, because uh, what economists teach, at least in the graduate room, uh, if not in the very you know, introductory economics, is a very different kind of economics. It's, a, it's, an, it's an economics that's full of qualifications and ifs and buts. It's an economics that has um, you know, uh, a very um, large room for uh, public interventions, government interventions to, um, uh, that are needed to make markets work better. Um, so neoliberalism, I think, has, is, 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 is a perversion of, of uh, some of the key ideas in, in economics, what, what one teaches, in a, let's say, in an advanced doctoral course in economics. And in that way, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a major departure uh, from economics uh, as a science. And I think what has happened is that it, in some ways, uh, it, it's been, it's a hijacking of some of the ideas um, into the public domain. Um, and sometimes I say that, that um, even though I'm a critic of neoliberal econ uh, 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 economic ideas, I'm much truer to the heart and the core of contemporary economics uh, than in fact uh, economists who are um, uh, selling neoliberal ideas because I think they're selling only one very particular narrow version of what it is that, that we actually teach. And I think the big advantage of countries that you mentioned that have done well uh, is that they haven't bought on to this ideology. They've remained very pragmatic. And I think, again, you know, China, um, other Asian countries are very good examples of that, which is they, they, they look and, and they learn from the rest of the world, but they always filter it through their own sense of what's likely to work at home, uh, what's the best kind of policy reform that I can do at home. Uh, so it's that pragmatism, that sense of uh, um, sort of self-conscious sense of we know how our society works and we can analyze our society and our problems and come up with our own solutions. That's often what is, work, what is lacked in countries that have simply wholesale taken those ideas. 
uh, as if it were actually sort of um, uh, necessarily good policy or good, a good set of ideas. Yeah, Professor Zaini. Uh, some economists, I think, believe that within eight to ten years, renminbi will take over as a reserve currency. If yes, then what are the consequences for U.S. or the global trade? Well, I, I have, you know, I have no doubt that, uh, you know, provided the the nightmare scenarios for China that I briefly sketched out uh, at the end of my remarks um, uh, don't get played out, that renminbi is going to become a more important uh, currency in the world. But I don't see it as becoming the most important reserve currency. China now needs the U.S. dollar. Um, and, uh, you know, so it has, it's, it's, it's got some interest in more international trading, more international use of its own currency, but I think it's going to move very gradually. Um, and remember what happened with China, uh, with Japan. Uh, Japan's currency became much more important, but it's, it's still overshadowed uh, by, uh, by uh, other currencies. So I think it's, I see it as a gradual process. I don't see it becoming a currency that's going to over, overshadow the United States dollar anytime soon, uh, even if, if China uh, continues to grow rapidly. I'm Dave Lewitt uh, from the Alliance for Democracy. You've spoken so much about national versus international, and I'm concerned about regional. Uh, in, order for, in order for governments to do the will of the people, we need more democracy. Uh, uh, public opinion polls have shown great dissatisfaction in the United States with, uh, with uh, corporations, too much power, uh, with Congress failing to come up with uh, adequate policies uh, and a certain rigidity which bodes poorly for the future nationally. And I'm just wondering what role you see for, uh, for regions like uh, New England, for example, or the upper Midwest or the, or the Pacific Northwest or the South. Uh, for uh, an improved system uh, which will enable us to, to achieve some of these goals of the ideal international system. Yeah, a uh, great question. I, I'm not sure I have um, uh, much uh, in, insight to offer. Uh, you know, I do think that um, what's happening at the level of states can be very important in a large country um, that is so diverse, and in some sense, uh, our, the federal system provides an environment for uh, experimentation that uh, you would not have had in a, in a unitary political system. So I think uh, it, it would be nice to see much greater effort on the parts of, of regional leaders or, 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 or leaders of various states uh, trying to reinvigorate, uh, as you say, um, the, the sort of regional democratic political participation, regional partnerships with the private sector, regional efforts uh, at developing the kind of, of uh, industrial policies and agglomeration economies and reinvigorating the sort of the, um, uh, the, the local um, uh, educational and industrial base. Uh, and, and, and the U.S. system provides uh, sufficient room for uh, enterprising, innovative leaders uh, at the level of states to, to, to do that. Uh, it's another question whether we actually see it or not. Uh, there again, I think, is, is an area where we, we could use more ideas. Uh, but in a country like the United States, as large and diverse it is, it's also the case that much of the action is determined by what happens in Washington. We have one single financial system, uh, and that means that those rules are set by and large in, in, in Washington. Um, and, and a lot of the discontent with democracy I see as a consequence of the way that we have mishandled hyperglobalization, uh, which is that governments have um, almost given up responsibility to take action, hiding behind the forces of economic globalization. And finally, it hasn't been just the right, it's also been the left, uh, because uh, increasingly, uh, the left also uses 
globalization or the imperative to compete in global markets for all of its pet projects. So it's one thing for the right to say, well, we need low taxes um, uh, because without low taxes, uh, we won't be able to compete in the world economy. But when the left also starts to say, well, you know, we need investment in education and infrastructure because without that we cannot compete in the world economy, well, that's sort of a perversion, right? I mean, we need those things if it's good for our communities and for ourselves. And you don't need to use economic globalization as, a, as, a, as, a, as an excuse for why those good policies ought to be adopted. But the consequence is what it does, it, it's just sort of, um, uh, it gives people a sense of a loss of voice, that the responsiveness of, of their elites and the political elites is not there. And, uh, and, 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 the, and the elites seem to have just sort of hemmed themselves behind uh, self-made constraints, because it's not like they don't have um, uh, the, the, the room to make uh, a, a difference. Uh, once again, it's partly, as we were discussing before, uh, the relative power of, of elites that like it that way, uh, but I think also it's been, frankly, a lack of ideas that, you know, that haven't had the kind of salience, the political salience, um, uh, to, to, to make a difference. Because I don't think it's really driven, uh, it's pinned down simply by the fact that banks or multinationals have too much power. It's also that um, we haven't been able to um, get across the right ideas. That's, I really believe that. My concern is ecological degradation, and I would like to draw you out a little more on some of these concerns that were raised by the first uh, first chap. Um, I, I, the word trilemma came up. I see a trilemma, along with a friend of mine, uh, Jan Otto Andersen in, in Finland, between making a bigger pie, producing more, distributing it fairly, and the third concern would be ecological uh, sustainability, environmental sustainability. That's, a, it seemed to me, a very basic trilemma we have. And, and, um, when this uh, gentleman raised the issue of ecological degradation, your response was in terms of depletion of sources. But I'd like to point out that overloading sinks is equally important. I'm afraid that that pollution is going to be a bigger problem in the next few decades than depletion. I don't think we're really going to have an entropy problem and run out of energy, mm -hmm. but I think we're going to have uh, the global warming that you mentioned and, and other problems of that kind. Now, that's a macro ecological problem, and I think very hard for national law to control. So this returns to your, your issue here, the uh, uh, hyper-globalization and so on. Yeah. I, I, I'm totally in agreement with what you said. I mean, there are some problems of which climate change is the most, is the clearest example, which are truly global problems that you cannot solve through national policy. These are what we call the global public goods. Global climate is a global public good, uh, which means that you cannot solve it in a decentralized way. And when what needs to be done with climate change, we roughly know what needs to be done. Uh, it's just that we haven't been able to figure out how to distribute the costs, both intergenerally and across different parts of the world. And that, it's that political um, uh, struggle that is keeping us from uh, doing anything. Um, and I think, I don't know how we're going to solve it, but it's entirely clear that we can only solve it uh, from uh, the perspective of uh, global cooperation. Uh, so uh, many other issues um, of, um, uh, of, of um, you know, sort of that pose ecological uh, threats uh, might be much more regional and local. And those might be, there are a lot of transborder uh, pollution issues or transborder um, uh, uh, issues that, that again require sort of co cooperate, cooperation, collaboration among different sovereign entities that should be handled below the sort of the, the, the global level. So I'm, I'm all with that. Um, I, I guess because my remarks were focused on economic globalization um, and uh, I, you know, I would argue that many, many of the issues that we discuss in respect to economic globalization, such as a relatively open and healthy world economy, global monetary and financial stability, I would argue those aren't global public goods in the same way that climate change is. That if all countries are running their economic affairs more or less appropriately, uh, 
that we get collectively a reasonably good economic system globally as well. Uh, so that, that, you know, basically the amount of global cooperation that you need or global coordina coordination and harmonization that you need over purely economic issues is nowhere near the kind of, of uh, cooperation you need in true global public good like global climate. Um, now, there is the issue of whether, given some of these issues, the problems that we face, whether we cannot address it through more redistribution rather than some making the pie grow. Now, that may be an option for some of the richest countries in the world, but I can assure you it's not an option uh, for the developing world. Uh, redistribution isn't going to get you anything there, um, and there's no alternative in those countries than to expanding the pie, uh, which is why I answered the way that I did uh, to the first question. Yes. So I want to go back to your thought experiment. Um, where you talked about outsourcing to an Indonesian factory that uses child labor. And I think in many ways that's an easy example. It's a violation of our regulations, it's a violation of our ethical standards. And in this country, particularly in an election year, we tend to glom all forms of outsourcing together. But if we talk about outsourcing of services, and particularly IT services in India, it doesn't look the same. There's no child labor. Those are by and large excellent working conditions, often much better than actually the places where people live. Um, they're great jobs. They spur kind of a virtuous cycle of education. So you see this huge increase in the demand for education among all classes in India. And yet, in this country, all we talk about is how awful it is. It's unfair. It's not a level playing field. It's not level the other way, I think. So I'm wondering your, what your perspective is. If one of our guidelines is distributive fairness, you know, shouldn't we actually be supporting that kind of beneficial global trade of services that encourages the right kinds of economic development? And I think we should. And I, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, because when we discuss trade and outsourcing issues, um, we do not often make the distinction that, in fact, some kinds of outsourcing uh, violates uh, our ingrained norms and values as a society, and therefore that it may be appropriate uh, to interfere in those kinds of, of trade, the same way that we block some market exchanges domestically because they violate our norms. Um, if we were willing to make those distinctions, my hope is that we might be better able to then accept um, the vast majority of trade that takes place, like your outsourcing to uh, relatively um, uh, 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 sort of your Indian outsourcing case in the case of IT services, which I don't think violates any ingrained domestic norm or social value. Um, and I think we have a much better argument against people who want to say, no, no, let's block that trade too. And then we have a much better argument that says, well, but on what basis? Why should we block that? Why should we block that if we do not block the counterpart exchange that happens domestically? when the economic outcomes are all the same. Um, and if the answer is that there are some kinds of outsourcing which are problematic because you know, they would violate if, we, if, if held domestically, domestic laws and domestic norms, then let's bracket those and say those are the ones that we have trouble with. Uh, and, and this doesn't get done because currently, for example, international trade rules make no distinction. Right, that, you know, that, that you wouldn't be able to interfere. The United States would not be able to block goods made in Indonesia used by child labor. As extreme an example as I did under the circumstances that I gave, if the U.S. blocked imports or restricted imports of such goods from Indonesia, Indonesia could tomorrow take a case of the World Trade Organization, and the World Trade Organization would find the U.S. having violated world trade law. And I think that's something problematic. Thank you. Thank you. So fortunately, my question is a direct follow-up to that. Um, I was wondering, is this new labor trade, um, first of all, even productive? I mean, well, ethical issues aside, is, does it pose the same competitive economic challenges as the, the former form of uh, labor exchange? And um, if so, d do you think it benefits both parties equally? Well, I mean, I, I was looking, you know, we engage in trade 
I mean, the best argument for engaging in trade is that it enriches the home nation overall. It expands the size of the pie overall, uh, albeit with some cost to some others, to certain parts, uh, certain interests. So in the examples that I was running through, they all had the same feature. That is that the overall size of the pie would increase, uh, but that there would be some people who would be losing out. Um, so, uh, so when you ask, you know, is it, is it, the, is it the same amount of, is it the same thing? My answer is yes, because I designed the thought experiments in such a way that the economic outcomes are pretty much the same, although they differ, I think, tremendously from the standpoint of procedural fairness and distributive justice. Um, now, if you turn to the question of what the consequences are for the exporting country, in this case, Indonesia or, or India and so forth. And now we can discuss whether those things are good or bad, whether in fact it's good for Indonesia to, I mean, it, it, and that's a hard argument because many of the things that we would actually consider to be sweatshops in poor countries are actually things that are better for people who are employed there compared to what their alternatives might have been. Um, and so we need to be clear that, uh, uh, you know, we shouldn't be so judgmental to think that things you know, employment contracts or employment conditions that are subpar relative to what we can afford here are things that are bad for the exporting countries. Often they're actually going to be good things over there. Um, but that still raises the question of, the, you know, what the right response domestically is. Since we do not trade to provide benefits for third parties, we, tra we trade to provide benefits to us, that's the main argument for gains from trade, then I think we ought to be evaluating those gains in a broader way, including all the distributional consequences. Okay. Hi. So, continuing on the issue of labor legislation, um, in Europe, uh, in the last few months, uh, a series of uh, reforms have been adopted of, of labor legislation that have, haven't led to the legalization of child labor, but they have led to the relaxation of labor standards and the loss of power of trade unions. And um, one of the main arguments that's been presented is that it is an inevitable consequence of, of a globalized economy and that we should uh, settle. To what extent do you think that it is inevitable, at least some form of relaxation of labor standards and some loss of power by trade unions? I don't think it's an inevitable consequence of uh, globalization. I think it's been very effectively used by, by employers um, as an argument against, uh, for relaxing many of the existing uh, labor codes. But I think what's happening in, in Europe today isn't the effect of globalization per se, but more the effect of the crisis and, and the need, you know, anytime indebted countries run into crises, then they become, uh, you know, open season for external agencies to impose their views of how their economy should be run. Uh, so uh, the OECD and the IMF, um, which long had in their drawer these labor code reforms, uh, you know, that became the opportunity when they now had an, a way of, of telling Spain and Greece and Ireland what um, Ireland doesn't really quite fit, but Portugal. Um, you know, this is a, you know, that's when they have power. In fact, you know, they've, you know, the, those countries have had to reform uh, their, their labor regimes uh, because of, 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 of as, a, as a quid pro quo for uh, getting financial support. Now, you know, I don't want to say that the labor regimes in, the, in Europe didn't need reform. I think often, and I think the Spanish case is, is a good example, I think they create bifurcated labor markets uh, with relatively privileged insiders benefiting from uh, sort of high standards and, and, and a great deal of job protection and, uh, and, and short-termers or short-timers or uh, um, contract workers who don't necessarily benefit from that. I think at least in part some of the Spanish labor markets were driven by the right idea, which is you want to integrate uh, these uh, different types of, of labor markets together, uh, but without necessarily sort of making labor conditions worse for everybody. Um, uh, one can disagree about the timing of this. I've always, I mean, I've argued that, you know, at a time of great austerity and, and big collapse and demand, you do not make it easier for 
employers to uh, lay off workers uh, because they already are want to lay off workers. You just make it easier for them to lay off workers. You simply aggravate unemployment, which is what has happened in Spain. Uh, but unfortunately, sort of because these plans were already in the drawers, and then when the, um, uh, the outsiders got leverage, then that's what got offered to them, uh, although I don't think the timing was right from the standpoint of, of uh, unemployment. Thanks. If I heard you uh, correctly earlier, you indicated that the totalitarian regime in China will be limiting for their economic future. Is that because uh, it doesn't allow new and creative idea, economic ideas to emerge? And the second question, I know it's hard to predict the future, but could you describe how that limitation might manifest itself and then what might happen as a consequence? Yeah, I, I, know, I, I think there's a very big difference between a phase of economic development and catch-up, which is largely based on, uh, um, on, on you know, building more and more factories, saving a lot, and investing in education, so accumulation, as opposed to the kind of growth um, engine that you need in later stages of development, which is much more innovation. Uh, and innovation requires an open system. Um, and I think what happens uh, in authoritarian regimes, and I, we're seeing a lot of the um, uh, examples of that already in China, is that you're building sort of lots of in insiders and lots of cronyism in the system that's sort of making it very difficult for outsiders to penetrate uh, in quite the same way. So you're, 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 str you're strangling um, the, the kind of, 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 of inno innovation uh, that the economy will uh, eventually uh, need to rely on. And I think the political system becomes more and more cronyistic. Uh, it becomes unable to respond to the changing needs of a much more flexible economy. Um, and I think, you know, uh, and ultimately, um, perhaps much more so than the economic needs of innovation, um, as people get richer, they want more responsive government. They want to have a voice. Uh, in the Arab Spring, it wasn't the worst doing Arab countries that had the revolution. It was the best doing Arab countries. Tunisia was by far the best performing Arab country, which is where the Arab Spring started. And the reason was, well, they created a big middle class, um, and the middle class now wanted, wanted a voice, and they didn't have it because the political system was closed and cronyistic. Last, last question goes to Pat. Okay. You have said that ideas are needed, and you obviously have many ideas. This is an election year. If you had the ear of the future leadership of the United States, what are the five biggest ideas you would give them? <laughs> well, I think um, one, uh, two ideas would be major boost in investment in the long-term uh, capabilities of this nation, public infrastructure and education. Um, now, those are things that are going to be costing a lot of money in the short term, but actually they pay for themselves in the long term. So I think we need to do the fiscal um, uh, accounts in a long-term way rather than the short-term way. Um, I would uh, put in place uh, tax incentives um, to um, uh, um, uh, change compensation schemes in medium to large-scale firms that would tie compensation of employees uh, much more to the performance of the firms, um, uh, so creating a much greater degree of, of, um, of, of uh, joint interest between the firms and their, their employees. Um, I, would be, uh, I would stop the signing of further trade agreements and uh, review uh, the World Trade Organization and existing trade agreements. Um, I would be uh, pursuing much more extensive uh, financial regulation uh, than, than what's on the, uh, on the agenda right now. Um, and uh, finally, uh, I would ensure that uh, the United States uh, isn't, um, I would ensure that employment, uh, unemployment in the uh, United States economy is, uh, is, is being reduced sufficiently rapidly uh, um, uh, through these um, expenditure programs that, that I've, I've already sort of uh, indicated. Well, I'm standing like a candidate here. What did you make me do? Um, so those are some ideas. Thank you. <laughs>
So that uh, concludes the Cambridge Forum uh, presentation on uh, the paradox of globalization, recorded in April 2012. We've been listening to uh, Professor Danny Roderick of the Kennedy School of Government uh, at Harvard. Uh, for further information, please visit us on the web at cambridgeforum.org uh, in Harvard Square. I'm Bob Kuttner, and thank you for joining us. <laughs>